Good afternoon, my friends. It is actually afternoon. I'm filming this on uh, November the 14th, Sunday afternoon. I'm actually in Colorado Springs, so thank you for joining me. This will be broadcast tomorrow morning, but I'm here at the home of my friends Ross and Carol Beans, uh, who are my hosts when I come to the Springs, and uh, they are the hosts with the most. I mean, Ross and Carol take such good care of me. They have a beautiful place for me to stay. And food and fellowship, it's just grand. Carol is a wonderful musician, and Ross is just my dear friend. They just take such good care of me. They, they are very fond servers of our ministry, One Voice Mission. They, are, uh, they serve on our board, and I just can't thank them, the Lord, enough for this, this, this wonderful relationship that we have. So thank you, Ross and Carol, so much from the bottom of my heart. And uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we were together, we were talking about how we are called of God to give honor and respect to those who lead us in governmental positions. And we were specifically referring to those in our first responders, our law enforcement, our, our fire department folks, these people that God has put over us, we are to give them respect. And as you recall, the scripture there that Paul gives us, we, th these people are ordained of God. They're put there of God. They're put in their positions by God. And we are to give them the honor and respect that is due. And when we do that, we honor the Lord. And there's some pretty strict language there for those that don't do that. So uh, on the one side of the coin, we have this very, very firm information from the Apostle Paul from our God about how we're to treat as God's people, those people who serve us governmentally. But this also raises a question. And that question is this, is there ever a time when God's people should take a stand against government, against government officials? And I think the Bible gives a definite answer, yes, yes. And there's some examples in the scripture. Uh, let's go back to the Old Testament. Uh, there in the book of Daniel, there's those three Hebrew children, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, he sets this idol and he says, the whole kingdom's got to bow down to this idol. And these three boys say, we're not doing that. The king says, well, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And they say, well, you, you can do that. We know our God can deliver us, but if he doesn't, it doesn't matter because we're not bowing down. Now listen, these were young men who were raised on the truth of God's word, the Ten Commandments. There shall be no other gods before me, Jehovah God said. And so they believed that. They bought into that. That was their saving grace, their belief in Almighty Jehovah God. And so they weren't going to bow. And you know the story. Nebuchadnezzar threw him in the furnace, and um, all of a sudden there was a fourth man in the fire, the Lord Jesus Christ, who delivered them, and uh, they came out, didn't even have singed eyebrows. Can you believe it? So, so here, here's the point. When the king comes around and says, you got to worship my idol. You have to worship my government. You have to worship my bank. You have to worship my whatever. You have to have these three numbers or you can't do anything. That's the Antichrist is going to do that to us. We have to take a stand. God's people are not going to get the mark. They're not. According to Revelation, God's people are not going to get the mark. Now, we may be a long way off from that, but the point I'm making is when the government stands up and says, you have to bow down to this idol and not your God, we have to take a stand. Then we come to the New Testament. There's old John the Baptist. He's in prison. He has made a statement. He's taken a stand against the sexual immorality of the king. You know the story. He loses his head for his stand for God's truth regarding sexual immorality. Now, my friends, we're living in a perverse generation. Sexual immorality is all around us, and it's becoming the accepted norm. And if you can't feel the encroachment of this community against the church, it, it, then, then you're naive. You're not paying attention. It's, it's happening. We are going to be the discriminators, the pastors who stand and preach the Word of God in truth, who, 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 who declare that these perversions are sin. They are, they are not of God. This is not the way that God would have people go. God established very firmly how sex is to be used, and it's not to be used in these ways. God calls these ways sin, calls them an abomination. And those who will take a stand against this, we're going to be discriminators, right? And so, but, but, but watch. John the Baptist lost his head. 
I don't, I don't know what these things mean, but I just don't, I know this. We've got to take a stand for the truth of God's word. It doesn't mean we have to be hammering this away all the time. And by the way, we should be as loving and gracious and kind to these people. All of these people have a heart that can be changed by the power of the gospel. And many of them are coming to true faith and their lifestyles are changing. Hallelujah. This is the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the way we, we, should, we should view them with the love and grace of God in our hearts and minds and our lips. But we not, must not cave to the sin. Uh, then I think of uh, Peter and the disciples right there. They're there at the gate beautiful. Jesus is, has ascended back into heaven. Here's his disciples. And there's the lame man at the temple. You remember the story. He's begging. Peter says, I don't have any money to give you, but what I have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he gets up and walks. And all the people that are there are just astounded. They're amazed, right? Well, there's a big uproar in the city. You got to believe these these religious leaders of the Jews. I mean, they thought they'd gotten rid of the Jesus movement when they got rid of Jesus, right? But he was raised from the dead. Five hundred brethren saw him, and now he's ascended into heaven. But they they still thought this is going to die down. But now, now we got people in his movement that are healing people just like Jesus did. And oh my! So they haul him into the Sanhedrin, and they they tell him they can't. They can't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. They can't heal in the name. They can't do this stuff in the name of Jesus anymore. Peter, standing boldly with the with the lame man who's been healed, standing right there with him, said, "Well, um, should we obey God or man? This is God's work. This is what God has called us to do." This man, Jesus the Christ, it is in His name that this man stands whole before you today. It is in this name, the Lord Jesus Christ, that this man was healed. And so here they are proclaiming, preaching the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Any government official that would come against the church and tell us that we can no longer preach, we can no longer witness in the name of Jesus. It could be your boss. It, it, it could be some other religious organization. It, it could be any number of situations that might come against the church and tell us we can no longer preach in the name of Jesus. We gotta take our stand. We gotta take our stand. Listen, I don't know what this will mean, but I know down through the centuries of time, God's people have been put in a position where they had to take a stand, and they did. And many of them lost their lives. Many of them were imprisoned, suffered greatly for the name of Jesus because they took a stand. I don't know what that means for us in this day and age. I know, as I said, the encroachment is happening, but we are called to stand and glorify the Lord. And this is this, is this grand hymn that we have. It's a new song uh, written by Twyla Paris. And I'm, I'm especially interested in this second verse. The hymn is entitled, We Will Glorify. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. We're called, my friends, to be respectful and honoring of those that God has placed in authority over us. He has ordained them. They are there for our good. We're to give them respect and honor. But at the point that they would come against us and tell us that we must bow down to their idols or that their sexual perversion must be accepted by us and that we can no longer proclaim and take a stand against the sin or we can no longer preach in the name of Jesus, we must stand for the Lord. We must give him glory. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Sing this with me as you do. Pray before the Lord that God will encourage your heart. It may not be in your lifetime, but it will be in some Christian's lifetime that they will be called upon to take a stand for Jesus. May we commit even now that if that has to be us in our time, that with God's grace, God's purpose, and God's design in our minds and hearts, take the appropriate stand for our great and glorious Savior. Jesus Christ. We will glorify. Sing it with me. We will